Okay, great. Now that I've had a chance to go through the derivation of the Mona Lake water balance with you guys, I want to show you how it manifests itself in this spreadsheet. So when you open up the spreadsheet, the first thing you'll want to do is go into File and then make a copy um, and then save it under something involving your own name. You'll be able to edit it once you do this. Uh, your other option is if you are not comfortable with Google Spreadsheets, but you are comfortable with Excel, you can always download this as a Microsoft Excel document and work with it in Excel. But because Google Docs and Google Spreadsheets is free, I'll be going through my explanation within this program. So I think it's easiest just to kind of go through this column by column. You'll see year here in column C, and you can see that this extends from just prior to the commencement of the diversions in 1941, all the way into the future. So we're looking at uh, past levels of Mono Lake and projecting into the future. Uh, lake volume starts out at this known quantity. Once the diversions began, though, we're actually solving for lake volume using our water balance formula as the change in volume is um, equal to the inflows minus the outflows uh, times a unit of time. So here, what you'll see uh, if I click on this, is that this formula is looking at the past lake volume and then it's adding the difference between inflows and outflows. This Q value here uh, is an inflow and it's, it's more of a, a net inflow that does not include the effects of evaporation which is being subtracted from that in this formula. Uh, I'll show you in a moment what formula is in this cell. Uh, but first of all, let me just say that the one is one year, since we're on one year time steps. Okay, let's take a look at this uh, net inflow term. Um, I'm actually going to change the column heading to reflect that this is kind of a net inflow, except for the fact that it doesn't include evaporation. Um, so this, in turn, is equal to the groundwater inflow plus the, the runoff, which is flowing into the lake, um, plus the precipitation flux minus the diversions from the lake. So that part is pretty straightforward. We could then solve for lake depth knowing the lake volume using that formula for a right circular cone. Uh, this is just an algebraic manipulation of the derivation that I just went through. D3 here that it's drawing from is the lake volume. The lake elevation is just another a simple conversion from the lake depth. So we're adding the elevation in terms of feet above sea level to the lake depth. Uh, so this is the elevation of the base of the lake, and then we're multiplying it by a conversion factor that converts meters into feet. The lake area is just pi times the radius squared. I showed you how to solve for that in the derivation. And then we get to the groundwater flux, which is this big number, which is the area of the watershed, minus the lake area. So this is uh, the precipitation. Um, precipitation is in N that is falling on the watershed outside of the lake and the amount that is assumed to go to groundwater is 30 percent of that. Okay, Then we get to runoff which as I said before is the more complicated of the formulas. Again we have this area of the watershed minus the area of the lake times precipitation and we take out what goes away to groundwater in H3 and then we multiply it by this scaling constant. Um, which is essentially the fraction that does not evaporate away. And it's assumed that the evaporation over the watershed is just a fraction of the evaporation over the lake. You'll notice that column J is the evaporation over the lake. Okay. So here's our evaporation rate. We find that a, a constant rate of 1.25 meters per year, even though that's probably not the truth uh, actually gives us a, a pretty good reproduction of historic lake levels. Uh, as we look into the future, though, uh, one of the things you'll be able to do is actually manipulate that evaporation rate. Uh, so you'll notice that it's just 1.25 in this column up until about uh, is it 2012 or 2013, um, when it starts taking that value from whatever you type into A5. So let's say I wanted to look at what would happen if the evaporation rate in the future was 1.5 meters per year instead of 1.25 meters per year, you'll see these columns are all st staying the same because it reflects the past, which we know to be a pretty good representation. But in the future, all of those values were changed to 1.5. Okay, I'm going to change it back. 
Here are the diversions. Again, this comes from data. Uh, it's just data that was copied and pasted in until we get to around 2013 um, when we have this complicated if formula. And if you look at this, you'll see that this actually comes directly from this chart. Now the way to interpret these if formulas uh, in Excel or in Google Spreadsheets is you evaluate the expression that you get to first. So if column R74, which is the highest elevation that the lake has experienced in recent history, is greater than 6391, what that means is that we're in the sustainable period. So we'll follow uh, this set of inequalities over here. Um, and so that's what's coded in into this next chunk. Um, when this parentheses ends, um, uh, let, let's see, actually the set of parentheses ends over here. So if, if we're in the sustainable period, then we evaluate this next thing. We look at, elevate, at lake elevation, which is in column F. If that is greater than 6391, then we go to this next if statement. Um, so now we know that this is true and this is true. If the runoff uh, ends up being higher than a particular value, um, then we, we say that the amount of diversions is just equal to the runoff minus the maximum allowable uh, diversion, uh, which I believe we're doing in meters. Uh, oh, here, here it is. Okay, all needed except for the 1.098 times 10 to the 8th meters cubed required to flush channels and maintain fisheries. So we're taking all, all of the runoff except for some um, amount that's needed for ecological flows. Uh, then if, if this isn't the case, if the runoff isn't higher than this particular value, then we won't take any of it. Okay. So if this inequality now is not satisfied, uh, what we'll go to is we'll look and see, well, is the elevation of the lake greater than 6388? That puts us in this middle row here. Uh, if it is, then we'll take the maximum allowable diversion, which is 1.233 times 10 to the 7th. Uh, if not, there's no di diversion. So then we step back up. Okay, so now this inequality uh, is not satisfied. We, we have not surpassed that 6391 elevation that puts us into the sustainable period. And if that's the case, we'll go and evaluate this set of laws. Um, so one, one hint in working with Google Spreadsheets is that if you type in something like an if statement, if you just write if, it tells you, um, it, it's helpful, it tells you how to evaluate it. So if this logical expression is true, um, you look at the first thing that comes after the comma. If it's not true, then you look at the second thing. This is just a really complicated formula because you have a lot of if statements nested together in the same place. But you don't need to write this right now, so you could just take that as a given. Okay, so there is not a precipitation gauge station at Mono Lake itself, so we have to take rainfall from a previous station. Again, this is just a column of data, um, but we have to correct it to uh, a value that is relevant to Mono Lake. And it turns out that if we look at the past data, Mono Lake receives about 37% of the precipitation measured at that nearby station. So we have 0.37 times that value in this column. And this is just a rate in meters per year. So like evaporation, uh, we needed to convert that to a lake, uh, to a flux. Uh, so we multiply that by the lake area, uh, which is in column G. Salinity is not something we've talked about a lot yet, um, but all this is doing is it's assuming that um, the salinity is equal to the original salinity, which was 54 grams per liter times um, the fraction of the original lake volume that the lake now occupies, okay? Or the fraction of the volume that was in the lake at the time a salinity of 54 was measured now occupies. Okay, so we've reached the end of, of Going through these columns, I just want to give you a quick introduction to how you might want to create a, a graph. So let's say we wanted to create a plot 
um, of the change um, or let's say we wanted to create a plot of lake depth and lake salinity over time. So I'm going to go ahead and select the year column uh, because that's going to be our x-axis and I'm going to hold down the I'm on a Mac so I use the command uh, key but I'm going to hold down the command key and select lake depth and I'm also going to select salinity and then you could go to insert chart and it will give you some suggestions it thinks maybe you want to look at an area plot that's not really the case I want you to to look at a, a line plot um, but I'm gonna click on use column uh, C as labels and so what that does is it says column C is the x-axis and so now it's correctly plotting salinity and lake depth as a function of time. Uh, and then I'm going to go to customization. And here I'm able to change the title of the chart. Uh, so we want something descriptive. So we want to say um, modeled lake depth and salinity over time. You could always change the position of the legend if you want. I, I'm pretty happy with where it is now. Um, but for anything you turn in in this class, I always want to make sure that you clearly label uh, your axis titles. So the horizontal title is going to be year. And did I miss the vertical title? Let's see. Oh, no. You have to select it. So the left vertical axis title is going to be depth or salinity. And Usually I want you to put the units here. You'll see the units are already in the legend and so it's going to be clear to any readers what units we're dealing with. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that chart and the way it looks. So I'm going to go to insert and if you decide to insert it and then you realize there's something that you wanted to change, you could always right click on it and edit any of these things. Um, if you want to, let's say you did want an area chart instead of a line chart or you wanted a scatter chart instead, you could select those things. If you wanted to reopen that original window that we were working on, um, you just go to advanced edit uh, and then you hit update when you're done. Okay, that should give you all the information that you need in order to start completing this assignment. Good luck!